session also for you to see it later on. So with that, I'd like to uh, begin um, uh, the, the brief presentation. So uh, Mark, if you can move to the first slide. <clears throat> So as I mentioned, I will be giving a very brief overview of the department, and then we'll have brief presentations by Professor Mark Snyder, who is the director, outgoing director of our graduate studies program, mainly for the on-campus PhD and master's programs. And then Professor Baltrusaitis will uh, present uh, a little bit of details and background of the uh, distance ed program. And then we'll have a panel discussion. And in the panel, in addition to the three of us, we have Professor Elsa Reichmanis, who is a faculty member who just joined us in fall semester. She moved from Georgia Tech. Professor Israel Wax, who is a faculty member in our department in the area of uh, catalysis. And Professor Jim Su, who is the new incoming director for the graduate program. Uh, so we'll be able to answer questions that you may have. Um, in terms of the way we'll structure the presentation, please do not hesitate to stop us. If you, this is completely informal. So if you want to interrupt and ask a question, uh, you can unmute yourself and ask a question, or you can post a question in the chat box uh, at the bottom, and then we'll pick it up at the, after we finish the presentation. We really want this to be more informative for you to, um, um, understand our program and the opportunities. And so uh, we are trying to make it as informal as possible. Okay, Mark, next slide. <clears throat> so uh, we are, a, and as many of you know, um, uh, hopefully we are uh, an internationally recognized program in chemical and biomolecular engineering. Our hallmark is interdisciplinary research. Our faculty members uh, work across disciplinary lines between chemical engineering uh, combined with uh, collaborations with bioengineering, with electrical engineering, with chemistry, uh, et cetera, outside of the department to create um, and solve problems at the frontiers of science and engineering. And um, this is the same spirit in which we train our students. And so our students learn, particularly graduate students, learn from this interdisciplinary flavor of research combined with a rigorous underpinning basic science and engineering. Uh, we are a relatively well-established program. The program began in 1903. And in, in 2003, we celebrated a centennial. So as of now, it's a 117-year-old program, uh, very well-established. Our PhD program began sometime in the 1950s. Um, and so that also is very well established. Next slide. Uh, very quickly, this is the snapshot of our faculty in the, in the department. Um, and you'll get a few of the numbers later on when Professor Snyder presents. Uh, but we have a breadth of uh, research expertise um, within the faculty. Uh, all the faculty are uh, known around the world and around, of course, in the nation for their uh, scholarly research. And this is really the underpinning strength for our graduate program. So when you come to our graduate program, you'll be assured that you are mentored by leading uh, uh, scholars in their respective fields. Next slide. Um, if that is not enough, you can certainly look at the long list of awards and recognitions that our faculty members have won over the years. And that should give you uh, a, a sense of the, the quality of the faculty, which ultimately determines the quality of the program. The list of awards goes from national awards to uh, society awards, to international recognitions, to uh, uh, named lectureships, um, uh, not only in the US, but um, uh, internationally. Next slide. Um, one uh, announcement I'd like to make uh, is uh, the arrival of our new faculty member, uh, Dr. Elsa Reichmanis. She's here on the panel, if you have questions for her. She started in our department in fall 2020, just uh, a few months ago. Uh, she joined as the Carl Anderson Endowed Chair in the energy sciences uh, previous to coming to Lehigh. She was at Georgia Tech. And before that, she had a career in industry at uh, Bell Labs in New Jersey. She brings a whole new uh, list of research areas uh, into the department, 
particularly in photovoltaics, organic semiconductors, and their applications in uh, flexible electronics and batteries. So we're very excited with the addition of a new faculty member who's also highly recognized. She's a member of the National Academy of Engineering. Um, and just in 2020, she was elected as a fellow of the National Academy of Inventors. Uh, so if you have any questions for her, certainly pose them at the end of uh, the presentation. Next slide. <clears throat> so I'll, I'll close by just saying that the ultimate metric for our graduate program, either master's or PhD, is the quality of our um, graduates coming out of the program. And the success of our graduates is really uh, a um, indication of how well we train our graduate students. Here are a couple of examples of uh, uh, graduate students, particularly PhD students, who have uh, gone on to um, uh, garner recognition in the professional societies. Um, and I picked one topic, COVID, because obviously we are in the middle of a pandemic. Both of these alums have been involved in COVID-related research. Uh, Dr. Susan Daniel is currently a full professor. Actually, she just got promoted. She's a full professor of chemical engineering at Cornell, and she has been working in the area of um, uh, understanding the targets for the COVID-19 virus to attach to the cell and how that understanding of that mechanism can be used to develop therapies. Uh, the other example I'm, I put here is uh, Dr. Steve Tang. He received his PhD at uh, Lehigh, and he's currently the CEO of a company uh, called Orashur. And if you looked at the Time Magazine's uh, December, late December issue, the technology that came out of this uh, company was featured as one of the top 100 products of 2020. This is a fast diagnostic test for COVID, uh, for coronavirus detection. Um, and so these are a couple of examples for you to get a sense of how much importance we put to the success of our graduates and, and the training that we provide to our program. So with that, I'd like to hand over to uh, Professor Mark Snyder. He'll talk about the on-campus PhD and master's programs. Mark. Uh, thanks, Mayrash. So um, I'll just spend um, about maybe about 15 minutes just to run through um, an overview of both our um, on-campus uh, master's programs as well as our PhD program. I think that the audience is comprised of uh, prospective uh, students in, uh, you know, in both in both areas. So just to give you a, a, a sort of a, a flavor of uh, where we are and, and what we do at Lehigh, um, just a couple snapshots of the campus. Uh, ultimately, chemical engineering is uh, housed in Iacocca Hall. It sits on the top of what's referred to as the mountaintop campus. Um, the main campus is uh, this, this beautiful sort of uh, uh, older, older sort of campus uh, just down the quote unquote mountain. Uh, but all of these campuses are connected by buses. And um, many of our students, in fact, um, commute back and forth between the campuses um, uh, on a very short uh, bus ride. Um, some of the, our, our state-of-the-art characterization facilities, for instance, are on, on what we refer to as lower campus, um, while our, our uh, research labs uh, are, are on the mountaintop campus. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, um, perhaps uh, you're elsewhere in the United States or outside the United States, um, uh, Lehigh is located in, in uh, the state of Pennsylvania over on the east coast of, uh, of the United States. Um, and actually in, in very close proximity to uh, several major cities, Philadelphia, New York City, uh, Boston uh, is within about five hours drive, Washington DC uh, also uh, just over, over about two hours from, from our campus. <clears throat> so Myresh already um, uh, mentioned uh, the, you know, uh, sort of gave uh, some snapshots of the faculty in our department. I just point out sort of by the numbers, uh, the number of faculty, um, uh, tenure track faculty, professors of practice, of, of uh, joint appointments as well, um, to, to point out that we are um, a fairly, you know, uh, smaller uh, department, um, but, but still uh, reasonably sized. Why I, I sort of wanted to point that out is that the, the size of the department and, and the size of our research groups, for instance, the class sizes really offer an opportunity for um, uh, real personalized mentorship uh, at, at all graduate levels, both at the master's level and, uh, and at the PhD level. Certainly we have a, a fairly long history um, uh, you know, in, of excellence in our department in, in, in terms of impact of research and educational leadership. 
um, you know, uh, Professor Thari already mentioned, you know, or at least showed a long laundry list of the many uh, accolades over the years for, for faculty in our department. Um, what I wanted to actually highlight, and, and I bolded here, is that our students too are very successful, our graduate students. So our students are uh, very frequently winning regional, national, and international student research and travel awards. Um, and I think that that's a, a testament to the, you know, the, the mentorship that we're able to provide as a department, the quality of the students that we're able to attract to our program. Um, I also point out here um, um, uh, some data from the 2010 um, National Research Council report that looks at ultimately um, uh, ranking of chemical engineering departments, actually many, many different departments. Um, and in, in that particular uh, survey, which is, is the, the most recent, believe it or not, is back in 2010. Uh, it hasn't been funded to, to be, uh, be redone uh, at this point. Lehigh was actually ranked 22nd overall um, uh, in terms of chemical engineering programs. I just point to that particular figure because um, that specific survey is uh, one that actually does uh, take into account um, data about the department's funding, publication rates, impact factors, these types of things. Um, and so as opposed to a, a, the, the US News and World Report rankings, which tend to be a, essentially a ranking done by department chairs, um, this is actually you know, based on, on, on hard data. And, and in that particular um, uh, report and, and with, with uh, sort of hard data at hand, uh, our, our program does stand uh, quite well uh, uh, relative to the programs in our in in the, in the U.S., so ultimately, Myresh mentioned that um, you know we have uh, a lot of high impact research, uh, really spanning quite a broad range of areas. And I try to highlight that here in this particular slide. Ultimately, we can sort of bin ourselves in terms of the faculty into you know four major sort of areas. Um, certainly, a, a group of us uh, uh, does research in the broadly energy and environment area. A separate and, and actually intersecting group uh, does work in the biomolecular sciences area. And, um, you know, sort of underpinning all of these and sort of cross cutting these are work uh, in materials and interfaces and systems and computations. Um, specifically, those two latter areas really can be divided a little bit further, you know, uh, in terms of materials and nanotechnology. We have certainly a strength in the department in colloidal and interfacial science, um, also a strength in molecular modeling and simulations as well as data science uh, systems and controls. And really it's the, the intersection of these sort of enabling technologies and these sort of application areas where, where we um, are, our students are working on, on uh, cutting edge sort of research and, uh, and projects um, uh, that are uh, quite well funded, uh, both federally all the way down to industrial sort of support, um, internal seed grants, so on and so forth. At Lehigh, uh, we, there is a, a real culture for collaboration, uh, not just in chemical engineering um, you know, alone, but also a, across the, the campus. This is where we really benefit from the smaller uh, size of the university, um, the sort of close-knit nature of the university. Um, the, the university within the past few years has established three interdisciplinary research institutes. It really underscores the, the, the drive for interdisciplinary research across campus. These three in institutes have uh, focus on sort of different aspects, materials and, de and devices, uh, more computational data science uh, focused uh, institute and a, a cyber physical in infrastructure and energy uh, institute. And most of, of, of us in the department uh, are, are involved in one, if not uh, two or are all of these uh, particular uh, interdisciplinary research institutes. The, the department has a state of the art um, uh, characterization facility all, all throughout the, uh, sorry, the, the university, um, specifically the Center for Advanced Materials and Nanotechnology um, uh, houses a, a state-of-the-art electron microscopy facility, um, a really world-renowned um, tr training program every summer uh, actually occurs uh, at, at Lehigh. Um, to, to other sort of supporting centers. I point the, to these centers simply because they enable us to do uh, high quality research. Uh, it allows us to access equipment, you know, that, that ultimately we don't have individually in our labs, but, but are, uh, are in fact on, on our campus. Um, and um, last but not least, I list the, the Baker Institute for Entrepreneurship and Creativity um, uh, at Lehigh. And so that gives you a, a bit of a background uh, just generally about our department what I think uh, ultimately makes it attractive for, for our students to, to, to study and do research here. Um, I wanna just briefly uh, talk about um, the uh, specific graduate programs that we offer. 
Um, they range all the way from PhD level uh, programs in chemical engineering to actually a slate of, of different master's programs. And what I'd like to do in the next couple of slides is just to give you a, a real high level snapshot of each of these programs. Um, we'll, we'll switch over to uh, having Professor Baltrositis talk about the specific sort of distance version of actually these master's programs, all the ones that have the asterisk next to them. Um, and then at the end, when we, when we have a panel discussion, I'm happy to uh, answer any you know, more detailed questions uh, than, than I might cover in, in these slides. So starting with the PhD program, um, just sort of a, 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 our PhD program at a glance. Uh, again, I, I really think the, uh, the sort of distinguishing character, characteristic of our program, sort of the hallmark of our program, is the fact that we really do offer a supportive environment that you know, uh, enables personalized mentorship, uh, given the size of our program, the size of our research groups. Um, and I think that our students actually uh, really do appreciate that, uh, that sort of personalized mentorship. Ultimately, the average PhD group size is about four in the department. Um, and so that really does allow for very close interaction with PhD research advisors. We do guarantee uh, a minimum stipend. At this point, it's $29,000 a year uh, for all of our PhD students, as long as they're making progress towards um, uh, programmatic um, both research and academic sort of milestones. Uh, of course, we cover our uh, tuition. And so for any student in our PhD program, there is no tuition cost out of pocket. Uh, of course, there's a, a, a subsidized health benefits package as well. Um, just to give you sort of a snapshot of this of our students um, and, and the program itself, uh, our program does have an 87% an uh, completion rate for the PhD, which is a uh, quite high rate relative to sort of national averages. Um, the average duration of the PhD um, actually based on sort of a five-year average is a, is a little bit less than five years at this point. Um, and that might be a reflection of the fact that we you know, have a mix of students coming with both their bachelor's or their master's degree already in hand. Um, that doesn't, you know, coming with a master's degree doesn't necessarily guarantee a shorter PhD. Um, really it's, it's quite project specific um, and, and to some extent uh, student driven as well. We do uh, have nearly 50% uh, female students in our department. Um, the, I, I point to this number. We, we offer you know, a number of, of different awards to our students uh, internally. And so each year we award uh, almost $40,000 uh, distributed across various sort of students, um, both merit awards as well as uh, for, for, for uh, on the academic side, uh, performance in the qualifying exam, uh, so on and so forth. And last but not least, we have a very strong track record for both industrial and academic placement of our, stu of our PhD students. In terms of our master's programs, our master's programs are all 30 credit programs. What that means uh, given sort of full-time student uh, credit load is that uh, our master's students um, typically complete the program in one and a half years, three semesters, or uh, at most four semesters. This is the on-campus students. We have various flavors, if you will, of the master's programs, a master of science in chemical engineering. This is, of course, um, you know, a balance of coursework as well as uh, research uh, in, in uh, faculty labs. The master of engineering and chemical engineering is a pure coursework based uh, program uh, focused on advanced engineering coursework. And 17 credits of those 30 credits are actually elective coursework uh, beyond the core sort of chemical engineering coursework. And so it really gives students in this particular program a chance to customize, if you will, their degree to best match their career goals. In addition to the sort of standard uh, chemical engineering uh, masters, both ME and MS programs, we also have master of engineering programs in what we refer to as biological chemical engineering and chemical energy engineering. Um, the names sort of uh, suggest what these, uh, what these degrees are, but the biological chemical engineering degree is really focused on a mixture of chemical engineering and biotechnology uh, sort of coursework. Um, and, and ask students to uh, essentially pick electives that span uh, biology, chemistry, and chemical engineering sort of advanced courses. Uh, again, giving a, a student a chance to really um, tailor, their, tailor their degree. The, the last uh, program that I mentioned here is the chemical en energy engineering program. Um, and it's really focused on, um, again, professionally oriented sort of graduates um, in the energy sector, um, primarily. Um, and, and the mix of sort of elective coursework, again, allows students to, to tailor their degree along those lines. We are, you know, 
quite student focused. Uh, we try our very best to offer a supportive culture for, for professional growth. Um, this spans anything from a uh, very vigorous, uh, 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 well attended sort of departmental seminar series. This is uh, leading academics and industrial experts uh, coming and giving seminars, uh, typically weekly or, or every other week each semester. We have a, a focused uh, first year research skills seminar series uh, offered to all of our first year graduate students, both PhD and master's level students, an annual graduate research symposium that ultimately gives our students a, a showcase of their, of their research. Our senior PhD students give uh, research talks. Our, all of our students offer posters, research posters, if, if, you're, if they're, you know, if, of course, the PhD students, master's students that are uh, in the MS program who are doing research will offer a poster as well. We, this is well attended by industry, um, other academics, and so it's a really great uh, chance to see what others are doing in the department, but then also to, to network for our students. I mentioned the, the sort of dollar amount that we distribute internally each year for, for recognition for our students. Um, these are just sort of the, the names associated with, with some of those awards that we give to our students, you know, based on, on merit performance in the qualifying exam so on and so forth. And last but not least, um, any student who has, uh, uh, thinks there might be interest in, in pursuing an academic career, there's a number of programs at Lehigh, both at the college level and the university level that um, offer insight into um, teaching and, and academia um, for, for any student who has, uh, has interest along those lines. Um, so just, you know, to, to point out, um, you know, where do our students ultimately go? It really is a mix. Many of our students do pursue industrial positions. This is just a, a list of uh, some, you know, uh, representative companies our students have ended up at, at recently, by no means an exhaustive list. We have placed students in academia as well, oftentimes through intermediate sort of postdoctoral positions. Students uh, currently or recently at MIT, Princeton, Harvard, top, uh, top rate uh, sort of programs. Um, and a number of uh, uh, past PhD students who um, are now in domestic faculty, faculty positions, uh, quite a number in international faculty positions or even uh, at the research scientist sort of level. Um, some of our students do pursue uh, national lab appointments. And I just put, put down here as an asterisk, we have had track record recently of some of our students actually carrying out PhD internships during the, the, during the course of their PhD. Of course, this is quite project specific and advisor specific, but there's a lot of opportunities to, to, to network with companies and, and to, to attend conferences and, and um, to, to really network uh, academically um, that it gives our students a, a real uh, leg up, I think, in terms of uh, finding um, employment, um, you know, upon their graduation. And so let me just uh, quickly end before I switch over to Professor Baltrasitis. The application deadline is, is, is approaching January 15th. I should point out though that, um, you know, that's not a, an absolute deadline. Certainly we, we accept applications after the 15th. The, uh, the, the real um, uh, application review process really initiates at that time though. So the, the closer you are able to apply uh, to the, the January 15th deadline, the better. I should point out that we, as of this fall, are no longer requiring any GRE scores to be submitted. And if they are submitted, we um, are committed not to use them in the application review process. Um, I list here what a complete application requires. Just note that we do ask our PhD applicants to offer three letters of recommendation, whereas our master's applicants um, are required to uh, submit two, uh, two letters of, uh, or, um, letters of recommendation. There is an application fee. However, um, any attendees of today's webinar um, will be offered an application fee waiver. Um, and just to, to give you a snapshot, uh, hopefully you've sort of looked at these PhD applicant profile, sort of average GPA from their BS versus MS. 52% um, of our applicants are domestic and uh, have a domestic BS or MS. Many international students come you know, get an MS in, in another uh, in another institution, and then ultimately are applying into our program. Um, master's applicants uh, profile, and and I should really emphasize, and I saw a question along these lines that was pre-submitted pre before this, that we have a really a, a mix of students that apply to our program, not just chemical engineering uh, backgrounds, but really um, what I'd call more non-conventional science and engineering backgrounds, certainly some chemists, physicists, physicists, polymer science, scientists, material scientists, so on and so forth. And so we would really encourage, you know, 
anybody um, uh, with, with interest that has a, a technical background to, to consider the program. And we're happy to work with you to, to see what, uh, if any bridging uh, sort of coursework might be necessary for, for you to be successful. So with that, um, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Professor Jonas Baltersaitis, uh, who's in charge of the distance master's program. Uh, and then we'll wrap up with uh, our panel discussion. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm advising distance graduate programs, which in a sense mirror a little bit the uh, on-campus programs we have master in, in, in chemical engineering, in biological chemical engineering, in energy engineering. And there, then interestingly enough, we have this certificate in chemical and biomolecular engineering, which I'm gonna talk about in the next slide. Let's, let's go to the next slide, please. So master of uh, engineering of biological and chemical engineering, you, 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 you already uh, have heard about, and it's a 30 grade course. It's different from very intensive on-campus program in the sense that uh, our students take about one course per semester because they are working professionals. So all, the, all, all of these programs that you see on the slide are professionally, for professionally oriented graduates. Now it's, it's not exclusive in a sense that we have uh, recent graduates who you know, graduate from, from our own program very recently. We have engineers who are well into their careers, you know, 20 years into their careers, who wanna obtain some advancement in, 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 in their company. And so they go back uh, to academia and, and they study for, um, the program runs up to six years and they obtain the, the master's degree. And the certificate is very interesting because it's a 12 credits. It's also oriented towards um, professional graduates, but it really helps uh, people to obtain new competencies in chemical engineering that are not intrinsically chemical engineers, but for example, started careers in chemical engineering. Um, uh, so, so we have uh, really opportunity not only for uh, chemical engineers themselves, but you know, chemists, even biologists and so on that currently are working in the industry and need this experience. So we have uh, a certificate, which then also can be by the way used to advance for a full de master's degree, degree in chemical engineering. So you can transfer those courses uh, towards your 30 credits. Next slide, please. So differently from what Professor Snyder said, we have a rolling application and we often admit people that just realize that semester is about to be over and new semester is, is, is about to begin. So, but normally we have fall and spring admission GRE scores are no longer required, mostly because you know, we have engineers and we judge them by the transcripts. That's the first requirement. I look at resume, personal statement, and, and you need to provide certain letters of recommendations and we, we make uh, our uh, admission judgment based on that. So again, I, I, I tend to, um, I tend to uh, think about this program in terms of two applicant profiles. One applicant profile is, is uh, pure and true uh, chemical engineering uh, uh, related uh, disciplines and uh, that, that, that have GPA typically above 3.0. And um, people just, who, who just recently graduated or well in their careers, I also, do not ever disregard the, the folks that are non-chemical engineers, right? All you need to do is have bachelor's degree in some relevant discipline, such as chemistry, biology, biochemistry, and others, and a decent GPA, and we'll give you a chance, you know, we have a bridging course that helps you to become successful in this, and uh, you can become a chemical engineer. Next slide, please. What separates our distance program uh, from others? Um, for masters of chemical engineering, <clears throat> you need to take four core chemical engineering courses. So that's the same as on-campus students or PhD students. And uh, 
really a large pool of graduate, very inter interdisciplinary uh, elective courses is the, uh, available within the, the department and then outside of the department. Um, you need to take 18 credit hours in the field of chemical engineering. And then the remaining courses you really can take from other departments. We have very good courses being taught by industrial engineering, by material science, by civil environment, and so on and so on. Very recently, we instituted even remote research because the times are such interesting where you can earn six credits, 400 level courses just by doing remote research upon mutual agreement between the, the faculty you know, and provided that it can be done. And you really study in your, your own pace, which is six years to complete a degree. And again, people typically take one course a semester. So, you know, they can actually do their primary work while they, they study. Now, certificate in chemical engineering, we, we do have bridging courses. So for the folks that, that, you know, are far away from the discipline initially, but somehow gravitated um, into it during their work, we have, you know, Chemie 201 and very commonly Chemie 383 where we prepare you for the rigorous advanced courses. And for a certificate, they will count out the, the course requirement. Uh, and in that program, you make you, you must take core course, um, two chemi courses, which can be core courses or electives, and one uh, from any remaining electives. Um, and again, so a successful completion, you can transfer that into and um, you know you can always find all these questions addressed. Next slide, please. You can you can find all of these questions you know in a single point of information if you email the email right there. I'll always respond. There is Eleni uh, who helps. Uh, Hugo Karam sometimes helps, and then we have these distant programs very clearly defined and described in the language. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Snyder and Professor Baltrusaitis. So we are now uh, open to questions. Um, you can post the questions on the chat box or you can unmute yourself and ask questions. Uh, this is your chance to ask uh, any and all questions. And we'd like to learn from you what your, what your interests are. Hi, I have a quick question. Yes. So for this, so uh, I was thinking about doing the uh, PhD program, and for the qualifying exam, is it more, um, is it more like general chemical engineering oriented, or is it more uh, whether or not you become a better researcher or a better like engineering researcher and and asking questions in those sorts? Right. So I, I'll ask Professor Snyder to reply to that, but in very brief, uh, we do try to. Uh, frame the qualifying exam in such a fashion that it tests your intrinsic um, skills as a researcher. But I'll ask Professor Snyder to respond. Sure. So, I, so let me just take one one step back. Um, in terms, of, so our PhD qualifying exam is uh, purely research based. Period. Um, the eligibility to take the exam is actually based on core coursework, uh, and we have a. a eligibility of, you know, maintaining a 3.0 or higher in core coursework. To be honest, we admit students into our program expecting them to far exceed that particular um, uh, benchmark uh, and, and certainly be able to take the, the PhD qualifying exam. The exam is uh, administered at the very, the very, typically the very first week of the sec second year in the program. So the, the second fall semester, our uh, students um, will uh, take the PhD qualifying exam. It's comprised of a, a written research report um, and an oral portion to the qualifying exam where students will make a 15, present, 15 minute presentation before a panel of faculty. Um, and then the balance of, uh, of the time, additional 20, 25 minutes is spent uh, discussing the research question and answered with the, with the faculty in attendance. Um, I should point out, you know, you know, how do we get to that point? Ultimately, we admit students into our program generally into a general pool, uh, typically, 
um, not pre-committed to a PhD advisor. Um, the advisor selection process uh, is carried out the very first semester on campus. And, and typically um, our students um, are assigned to research groups by the very beginning of November, that very first semester on campus. And so what that means is that our students you know, join a research group at the sort of the end of their very sem first semester on campus and have you know, the end of the first semester, the break between semesters, the spring semester and the full summer without coursework actually come up to speed and makes um, quite significant progress oftentimes uh, on, their, on their PhD research. And so, you know, that leads ultimately or sort of culminates with the PhD qualifying exam where it gives you an opportunity to ultimately present and, and somewhat defend the work that you've done and, and think about sort of chemical engineering aspects of the work that you've done up to that point um, in, in, the, in the qualifying exam, so. So for the qualifying exam, is it, is it more like you review a certain topic or you review a paper, like say, let's say you want to focus on like graphite nanoparticles or something like that. So you just focus completely on that or do you like set it's, a plan and it's say, actually, hey, yeah, the so, next five years? So the, so, so the, the uh, qualifying exam is based on the research that you're conducting with the faculty member uh, up to that point. And so <clears throat> it's sort of a, you know, first insight for, for the faculty into your understanding of the research project that you're working on. Um, and um, we give, you know, a set, you know, very clear sort of uh, eight points that we're looking for, for students to address, ranging anywhere from detailed sort of literature review surrounding, you know, the project that you're working on, the, the funded project that, you, that you're working on with your faculty advisor all the way through to, you know, detailed understanding of the techniques that you're using in the work that you're doing, um, as well as, um, you know, specific results that you've obtained up to now and uh, up to that point and, and an understanding of, of those results and, you know, thinking beyond those results, you know, what, what's sort of uh, coming next? How does one think about those results from sort of a chemical engineering perspective um, are, are, are topics that are sort of addressed in that, and that uh, especially in the oral exam uh, itself. So it's not just a topic that you pick on your own, it's, it's your research topic that you're gonna be working on for the, the duration of your PhD. Um, we've done that specifically to make sure that we don't sort of derail any momentum uh, for, for PhD research. Um, and so, you know, there's, a, there's always a learning curve as you sort of join a research project um, but the idea then is that since we have this research-based qualifying exam, you can sort of, you know, uh, use that as like a milestone that, that, you know, allows you to sort of, you know, continue right along after you, after passing the PhD qualifying. Okay. Yeah. And um, I had another question about like kind of the, the overlap between the different concentrations. So I was interested in the energy environment, materials and interfaces and utilizing computations um, for material science so that you could be used for energy environmental applications. So how often is there a lot of overlap in those within the professors? So may, maybe I'll, I'll jump into that. I can mention that. So certainly uh, faculty members are fairly interdisciplinary. So they cut across any areas ultimately a problem will define what underlying science and engineering you're gonna use. So faculty in general cut across energy problems and materials related problems. The materials related faculty cut across into data science and computational methods. So each of those mix of topics for each specific project uh, are dependent on the, the project details, right? Uh, so we have a project that a faculty member is doing where they're using computational techniques to discover new materials. Uh, and so it involves data science, computational methods, but also ultimately the application is um, uh, in the development of new materials. So, right. yeah. Yeah. Okay. So okay. let me jump here. I have a few other questions coming in. Uh, one is from Brandon Fitton. He asked the question, what are your thoughts on mechanical engineers joining the program? I'm a mechanical engineer and have been working in the chemical processing and biotech industry for the past four years. So um, maybe I'll, I'll answer that and I'll point to a couple of our faculty members here to add their perspective. Um, so Professor Elsa Reichmanis, who I mentioned is our new faculty member, she's a chemist by training and she's been in 
chemical engineering now, you know, in her previous career at Georgia Tech and also now at Lehigh. And that should tell you a little bit about, um, you know, the ability of the program to um, take into, basically take people with backgrounds outside of chemical engineering and integrate them into the program requirements. Um, the other example I can give is um, another faculty member in the department is a mechanical engineer by training. Uh, but he's been in chemical engineering throughout his, uh, his career. Um, so in general, to answer your question, you should be able to transfer very well because overlap between chemical engineering and mechanical engineering on many core topics is substantial. Fluid mechanics, heat transfer, uh, energy problems. I, I think the big jump you have to make is the chemistry and the biology or the biochemistry as it relates to biochemical problems. Maybe I'll ask uh, Professor Eichmannis to say a few words about the interdisciplinarity and the ability for non-chemical engineers to get into chemical engineering. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. <laughs> uh, yeah, so let me build on what Mayoresh just mentioned that you know, what chemical engineering really is a very interdisciplinary field uh, and the fundamental engineering aspects, I think, impact many different areas. And so particularly, you know, having, let's say, a mechanical engineering degree or a chemistry degree or a physics degree provides you with fundamentals that can be applied in multiple areas. And then having, you know, from an industrial experience, having broadened one's background, building on that initial sort of fundamental knowledge that was acquired, I think that also tends to broaden interests and the ability to be successful in a very wide range of areas. And so, yeah, personally, I think that um, with a mechanical engineering degree, that there certainly is sort of the fundamental um, understanding uh, through the ME coursework that really matches very well with what chemies do. And, you know, frequently it's sort of hard to figure out, well, what really is mechanical engineering research versus chemical engineering research? Uh, and, and so the interdisciplinarity of technology today and directions of research, I think allow us to be very flexible uh, and certainly coming into a chemi PhD program with a non-chemical engineering master's pro or bachelor's degree, um, there certainly is the opportunity to be very successful. Yeah, yeah. And the same goes, I'm guessing, Brandon, you may be asking this question from the perspective of the master's program. And certainly for the distance ed master's program, if you are coming in as a mechanical engineer, uh, certainly transitioning to chemi uh, is not, is pretty, should be pretty seamless. So I don't see any issue. There's another question from Sarah Walters. I have a question on joining and learning more about different research groups once admitted. What is the process that students go through to select an advisor and begin research? Uh, Mark, you want to answer that? Sure, so we, as I mentioned, we have an advisor selection process that runs for the uh, first portion of the fall semester, uh, the first pro, uh, fall semester in the program. This starts with uh, individual faculty making short half hour research presentations describing the research group, the type of work that goes on, you know, maybe specifics of a, a research project or projects that they're offering. And then students are given ample time and encouraged to meet with as many faculty uh, as possible um, to, to, you know, talk one on one about um, the details of a project. The hope is that, you know, you actually in that process get to know not only the details of, of, of particular faculty's research and projects or projects, uh, project or projects they might be offering, um, but also let them get to know you a bit. Um, and at the end of that, uh, so typically about middle of October, um, after about a month and a half uh, time for you to really explore all the research options 
options uh, that, that, are, that are there for you. Um, you're asked to rank order your top choices for research projects. Also provide a detailed sort of narrative uh, describing, you know, what specific aspects of a project that you like. You, you, you know, we encourage you to sort of raise uh, concerns about specific projects, give, you know, sort of uh, details of, you know, uh, how you have ranked one project versus another. And with that information, um, advisor, select, uh, advisor assignments are ultimately made uh, using the student input as well as faculty input um, in, the, in the process. And those assignments are typically made by the beginning of November. Yeah. So there's ample opportunity to, to have discussions with multiple faculty members to learn about their research, to see the best match. And what we have found is students um, may have a different perspective before coming to campus about certain areas. They may not know about uh, emerging areas because they come perhaps from a traditional chemical engineering background, but after they come uh, on campus and they talk to faculty, they might suddenly realize, wow, I never thought that this was such an exciting area. And uh, it is very common for students to change their mind uh, compared to what they were thinking before they came to Lehigh. So that's a very common thing uh, that happens. And the process allows you the flexibility to do that. So you're not pre-assigned to an advisor. You uh, come in and make that decision uh, together in the, in the process. Um, here's another question. Is the Lehigh University admission process committee-based? Uh, yes. So there is, as you know, we have uh, all the committee members are here on the webinar today. So both the PhD and uh, also the master's level admissions are based on a committee discussion, uh, at least sharing of, uh, you know, whether a student fits the program or not. So uh, there is input from multiple uh, faculty in the process. So it is committee based. Um, Here's a question from Niels. Uh, my research background is in energy and environment. However, I prefer to work in nanotechnologies. Should I mention both reach research interests in my statement of purpose? In case students are assigned to professors, is it advisable to mention names of potential advisors? Not necessarily. It's good that if you give as much information about your interest as you can, uh, but that's not required and that doesn't change anything. Once you come on board, you know, there is enough flexibility for you to be able to pick advisors. But ultimately, <clears throat> from your own perspective, it's good to spend some time thinking about what gets, what gets you excited and capture that in your statement of purpose, your essay, so that we know, you know, um, about you and that we are able to see uh, whether you're a match for the program. Whether it's a specific person is important, but not as important. Right, it's less important. What is more important is your passion and your interest in doing research in a, in a broader area. Uh, for your specific case, you talked about energy, environment, nanotechnology. There are actually faculty who cut across both those areas. So you could end up doing a nano related project, but with applications in energy, right? So you may find that out once you come here uh, that that opportunity exists. So. Uh, it, it's not critical that you mention one or the other. You could mention a, a range of uh, interests. Um, so one question from Jingwen Luo. How many graduate level credits can be transferred? Uh, maybe Mark, you can answer that. We have gone through this many times. Sure. So the, I mean, this, this is somewhat dependent upon the master's versus PhD. So PhD level, uh, sort of coursework, um, you know, if students are coming into our PhD program with a master's in hand uh, from another institution, um, we do, so our, our program has four core courses and four elective course requirements in the, uh, for, for PhD coursework. We um, will waive up to two of the, of the four core courses and, and up to two of the four elective courses based on coursework that you've taken at another institution. There's various sort of stipulations, um, you know, on what's required for for that to happen. Sort of the grade that was earned in the course, um, you know, uh, past our, our faculty members who teach the comparable course at Lehigh, taking a look at you know the course content and making sure that there's a 
you know, reasonable overlap between the course that we have on campus and, uh, and the one that uh, maybe you've taken in the past. I should point out though that it's not a credit transfer as much as it is just a course waiver. So you still ultimately are gonna be taking those credits, um, but there are gonna be research credits. Um, and and uh, it's not that you, you know, so ultimately you, you do you know, take fewer courses in those particular cases. Lehigh will um, has a policy to um, allow for nine, I believe, transfer credits uh, at the master's level um, from outside of, of Lehigh. Um, and the stipulation there, though, is that those, those courses could not have been used uh, for a prior degree at a different institution. Yeah. Okay, uh, here is a good, very good question from Kamiar Karimi. Is it possible to conduct co-supervised research with other CHB faculty members or perhaps with faculty members from other departments? Uh, the answer is yes, of course uh, you can. And uh, certainly uh, many, many of the uh, projects within the department are co-supervised uh, with faculty members within the department. That's very common, of course. Um, all of us here on the uh, webinar today have gone through that experience, but you can definitely have co-supervised projects with faculty members outside the department. Um, I didn't mention here, but in, we have a faculty member jointly appointed with chemical engineering, but his home department is material science. And this is Professor Chris Kiley. He's in material science and engineering at Lehigh. And over the years, he's had uh, many jointly supervised projects with uh, uh, faculty members in our department, uh, particularly on grants that are on which they are working together. So that's, uh, that's very common. Once again, I go back to the one of the answers before. It all depends on um, uh, the specific project. Projects are not defined based on disciplines. They're defined based on the problem. Right, whether it's solving an energy problem or a water problem or a security problem or a data science problem. And depending on the need of that problem and depending on the funding that or the grant that has been written to solve that problem, uh, faculty from different departments can come together. And so the student who's working on that project works uh, jointly with those faculty. That's a very good question. More questions? Once again, you can certainly unmute yourself, ask questions. Mark, since we have a few more minutes, uh, are any of the questions that were pre-submitted uh, things that we did not cover? Let me just quickly look through. I tried to, uh, you know, prepare the slides to answer many of those questions. Um, we've talked about the PhD qualifying exam, advisor assignments. Those are, are common questions. A lot of students, um, you know, have raised sort of, uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, um, whether you're, you know, don't live by us in, in the United States or if you're outside the United States, you know, what's cost of living like, what, what about sort of uh, availability of housing. Actually, Bethlehem, Pennsylvania has a very low cost of living. And so, for instance, for our PhD students who are, you know, uh, receiving a stipend, you know, there's, there's never struggle uh, to, to be able to, to you know, uh, rent an, a, an apartment uh, in the area. There's, you know, ample housing, both on campus and off campus housing uh, for, for our graduate students um, uh, as, as well. Um, the, there's a question about funding for, uh, for master's programs. Our master's programs are all at this point self-funded programs. Um, and so that's something to, to, to consider. Um, we do have, uh, you know, if you're in uh, our master's program and, and you get involved in research and you, you know, think that you wanna pursue a PhD, we do um, have students who will apply into our PhD program at the conclusion of their master's degree. Um, and, you know, if, if, if things are uh, going well, um, and certainly you've made progress on some research at the master's level, um, that's certainly, you know, um, we, we know you better than any other applicants. And that's, that's, a, that's a, 
uh, a potential benefit of, of getting into to, to the master's program. We do ultimately require a formal sort of um, application process though into, into the PhD program. Um, we've talked about how long it takes to do a master's degree, the on-campus version about a year and a half to possibly two years. Of course, the distance program takes longer because you're doing one course at a time. Um, I, sh I should also, I guess I should also mention that you don't have to only do one course per semester, right? So some students who may be transitioning between different careers uh, and maybe uh, not working for a, uh, a semester as they're transitioning between jobs could end up taking more classes per, in that semester. So uh, one course per semester, even though is the typical for a full-time working person, you could end up uh, you know, doing more, particularly I'm talking about the distance ed program. For the on-campus, of course, it's a full load of um, three or four classes per semester. Um, maybe I'll answer, there, there is, uh, quite, Mark, are you done? Sorry, I, I interrupted you. Uh, yeah, I, I, I believe that that covered most of the questions that were submitted in advance. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a question came up here, chemical engineering is in collaboration with the bioengineering department, is that right? So the answer is uh, no, uh, bioengineering is a separate department, chemical engineering, chemical and biomedical engineering is a separate department. But of course, faculty in the two departments collaborate with each other. So there is no question, but there is a separate degree program for bioengineering and there's a separate degree program in chemical and biomedical engineering. So there are two separate departments, but as with any other department, we have extensive collaborations uh, with the bioengineering department in particular, because our department name is chemical and biomolecular engineering. We do have a heavy emphasis on uh, biomolecular research in the department and therefore there is expected to be collaboration with uh, colleagues from bioengineering. Um, one question here, which I think was pre-submitted, as someone who wants to switch from material science to chemical engineering, what prerequisites do you expect me to have? Um, once again, um, the, the ability to move from material science undergraduate background to graduate chemi is dependent on the courses you have taken. Um, and to be able to facilitate that transition, we have what are called the bridging classes. And Professor Balthus Said has talked about that. Those bridging classes are also available for on-campus students. So you could take those bridging classes before coming to campus, uh, get familiar with the chemical engineering principles, and then formally get into the chemical engineering master's or PhD program, right? So, so there is a path for, for you to transition. Uh, there is obviously considerable overlap. And so you will find material being similar, uh, but problems are solved using different techniques, a different approach, which is unique to chemical engineering. And that's the portion that you have to learn in the bridging classes. Uh, and so, yes, you can do that. Uh, the prerequisite is that you get through the bridging classes or you show that you have taken some of the typical classes that we know you will need to be able to be comfortable with chemical engineering classes. Um, There's one question here. If a core course was already taken in the undergraduate part of my curriculum, will I need to take it again for graduate? This is from Giovanna. Um, who maybe Jonas, you want? Yeah, to it's 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 the same reoccurring question, and Professor Snyder already talked about it. The course can count, uh, at least in distance program, only if it was not taken for the terminal degree, right? So if you if you've taken it uh, for and graduated and used it in your transcripts towards a degree, it does not count. It cannot be transferred. In, in many cases, this is a case by case situation, <clears throat> but uh, we still have to live within the university guidelines of uh, how they allow transfer of credits. Hi, Rash. Yes. Um, this is Janine, I'm sorry. I just wanted to um, address that also. As um, 
there is a graduate course transfer petition that mm -hmm. if the student does not use that particular course for their undergraduate degree, they do need to fill out that petition in order for it to transfer in as a graduate credit. Right. So right. I just I just wanted yeah. to let that student know that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good point. Thanks, Janine. Okay, we are almost out of time, but here's one question that came from Kamiar. Um, the other question that concerns me is the possibility to retake the qualifying exam in case someone, God forbid, fails the first time. In other words, what are the chances to pass the qualifying exam the first time? <laughs> we expect everybody to pass, let's put it this way, because you guys are all good. And uh, so that's, that's definitely there, but maybe Professor Snyder can answer that sure. question. Yeah, so I, I mean, so of course we, we admit students into our program expecting you to be successful, right? And so we're not, we, we do everything that, as, as much as possible to make the qualifying exam process and the, you know, what we're looking for as transparent as possible from sharing sort of the criteria that we use to, you know, uh, sort of score uh, qualifying exams from day one when you step foot on campus. You know, that being said, you know, many, most of our students will pass the qualifying exam. But you know, as you might expect, there are students that will struggle on occasion. Um, but I what I would point out, though, we do allow as long as you've met the criteria to, to take the exam, you know, outright without you know formally petitioning to take the exam. If you've slipped below the 3.0 sort of benchmark, um, we do allow students um, who struggle uh, with an attempt on the qualifying exam actually to retake the qualifying exam um, about six months after the first. Okay. Uh, and so you are allowed that sort of second uh, second chance. What I think is actually um, uh, beneficial there is that the feedback that you get from each of the exams is somewhat detailed. So um, outside of just a decision on the exam, we do give feedback on specific areas out of the sort of eight criteria that we look for in exam uh, in, in the exam that maybe uh, were found to be weaker. And so you know between that and a discussion with the research advisor. Um, after you know, a failed attempt at the first qualifying exam, um, students can really sort of focus their attention on, on sort of what the weaknesses were perceived to be um, and, and make a, a good effort to sort of uh, address those weaknesses by the second time you take the qualifying exam. Um, and so, you know, I, I always point out that there, you know, I can think of numerous cases where a student uh, struggle with the first time through the qualifying exam actually, you know, it helped them focus uh, sort of their attention on specific sort of weaknesses. They did, you know, well in the second qualifying exam and, and came out with very strong PhDs, right? And so, so I think um, we've tried to make the process as, um, as useful as possible for, for both sort of learning and growth um, in, in, in outside of maybe the little bit of pain that, that might be there if, if, you, if you struggle with the first attempt. Okay, I guess we are just a little bit out of time, but um, uh, thank you very much, uh, all of you for attending. Uh, if you do have additional questions, do not hesitate to contact us. I should point you to, um, uh, uh, of course, uh, all of us on the, on the panel and on the discussion today, but also um, uh, Ms. Uh, Eleni, who's also there on this call, and she's the in charge of helping with graduate questions uh, related to application. And also you heard from Mrs. Janine Yeckles, who also can help in any specific questions that come up. Uh, but do not hesitate to contact us. Uh, we hope to see your applications and eventually we hope to see many of you uh, in our program. Um, but if, if uh, if we don't, hopefully you've learned something about our program that you can tell your friends, uh, your colleagues about the opportunities that and the flexibility of the program that uh, that Lehigh affords for uh, in, in chemical engineering. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks to all. Have a good week. Bye. Bye.